Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassnode video report for week 9, 2024. Now with the launch of these new ETFs, which have been an incredible success, certainly for me as an analyst, they have blown away my expectations in terms of the total inflows. Uh, as far as I can tell, and as far as I'm aware, they are some of, if not the most or best performing ETFs in the history of ETFs. Um, now, of course, we could do all sorts of things like inflation, adjust them and all test all these things. But, uh, you know, we are talking about billions of dollars of net inflows. Um, and I believe over the last 30 days, if you take the first 30 days of, um, of any of these ETFs that have launched, uh, the iBit um, uh, BlackRock and the Fidelity uh, FBTC, are two of the best performing that we've ever seen in terms of AUM. So um, really quite extraordinary to see. And off the back of that, there's a lot of talk and people who are looking at what is the multiplier effect? So what do I mean by that? How many dollars going into the Bitcoin system can generate a, you know, one? how many dollars need to go in to generate a $1 change in the market cap? This is a you know, it's, it's like a multiplier effect. It's trying to understand the liquidity profile because obviously um, we don't have uniform dollar in versus dollar out um, when it comes to any asset, but uh, obviously Bitcoin in particular. So with all of the ETFs as context and our backdrop, what I want to do is actually focus on and just, you know, this is not the answer to the question, but this is certainly a framework to, that we can think about what is this kind of liquidity multiplier effect that we see for Bitcoin. Now, the reason why we're going to go down this pathway is that we have a very unique and very special set of tools called on-chain data when it comes to Bitcoin. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the Realize Cap. If you spend any time on this channel, you will know that I come back to the Realize Cap all the time. And that is because it is the bees knees metric. If you understand and learn what the Realize Cap is how it's constructed and all of the stories that are captured within it, all the derivatives that come away from it, it is the centerpiece of some of the most powerful stuff that we do in on-chain analysis. And it really is because it's naturally liquidity adjusting. We're going to spend some more time talking about this. But what we're going through today, we're going to start with a view on the ETF landscape. We've recently at Glassdoor rolled out some ETF metrics. Um, so we'll touch on a couple of those. And then we're going to dive in, explore the realized cap, go back to the basics and just explore what it is, why we're going to pay attention to it. Um, for those who haven't seen or read, we do have a report called on our insights portal and also a video that's associated with it um, called the Realize Cap, the foundational metric. I think it's called the one metric to rule them all in the video title. The important part to take away is that the Realize Cap is a really critical metric. And any analyst who wants to, in fact, many analysts that I've spoken to who are getting into the world of on-chain, um, including some of my colleagues actually, have told me that the Realize Cap was that hook. It was the thing that helped them understand why it matters. And that's why we're going to bring it back and use this kind of liquid self-correcting, liquidity adjusting metric to understand how many dollars come into Bitcoin um, to produce a $1 change in the market cap. It's a really interesting concept, um, certainly just a framework to think about it, but uh, let's get stuck into it. Okay, so where I wanted to start it is, uh, you know, I mean, the price chart really is kind of a story unto itself. Um, in, in many ways, it doesn't really require that much commentary. Um, it has been a truly extraordinary rally. Since the bottom here in 2022, uh, following FTX, 2023 was a fantastic year and 2024 has just continued to impress. Um, we really are in very, very thin air. Bitcoin punched up to about $57,500. Um, this is the highest level. We are talking about all-time high zone in, in terms of the time that we've been up here. So really quite thin air. We did a, a report a couple of weeks back called Supply Discovery, which really describes that there just isn't that much supply still held at those cost bases. And those that do hold it, they've probably forgotten about that cost basis because they've been their long-term holders and they've probably got many other UTXOs that are in a far more favorable prices. So as a result, we are in a in a bit of a state where there's just not that many coins still held with a history and then more importantly actually investors who are looking at 58,000 and saying well that's my cost basis and I'm sick of this thing I'm going to get out so in many ways we're in a not quite price discovery but we're certainly in a realm of supply discovery where there's just not that much supply that is still locked up there and probably overly concerned about their cost basis at uh, 58 60 65,000 Okay, so moving on to the ETFs, because I think this has obviously been a centerpiece. I mean, it's just, it really has blown me away as an analyst for how much 
inflow we've seen into these things. Now, of course, there is a very interesting dynamic, and we'll spend more time on this in the next chart, but we have GBTC, which previously, well, sorry, I shouldn't say previously, still is the gorilla in the room. Um, it still holds 440 something thousand BTC. Now that is down from a high, I mean, back at the absolute peak, it was 661,000 BTC. We've seen about 150 or 160,000 Bitcoin get pulled out of the GBTC ETF. So on net, we've seen an enormous amount of redemption um, for a variety of reasons. There's lots of investors who want to move away from the much more expensive 1.5% fee. There's many investors who probably held through the premium going through to a discount and probably weren't so happy with the uh, uh, trading at about 50% of NAV. There's a whole assortment of reasons why GBTC is seeing outflows. But what we have seen is IBIT, which is the BlackRock ETF, and Fidelity being the second largest. So um, number one and number two, excluding GBTC, 130,000 or just shy of for uh, for BlackRock and 96 or almost 97,000 Bitcoin um, flowing into Fidelity. So really quite just astounding numbers. We're talking about 6 billion, 5 billion. We're in the order of billions. Um, and during recent days, in fact, let's go down to this next chart. What I've done here is break down the daily flows. So this is the one day change. Now, this is not a perfect model. What I've essentially done here is because GBTC has been the dominant one that's been outflows, there's been outflows from some of the smaller ones on the occasional day, but for just for simplicity, just to kind of keep this chart nice and clean, I've essentially put any time that we have GBTC, I mean, it's been almost entirely outflows since, uh, since the ETFs went live. So the red bars really just show the one day change of GBTC. Um, the green bars is the one day change of everything that isn't GBTC. So again, just trying to simplify the model. Um, and what we're looking at here in the blue line is that net flow, right? So on a daily basis, in USD terms, what is the net flow? Now, just to put things into a bit of perspective, um, during mid-February, we were hitting numbers of, uh, you know, on net, $430 million a day. At the peak, $830 million a day. Um, it's 250. We are in the order of hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes almost half a billion dollars in net inflows. Um, this is just, it really is incredible, right? And on the scale of one to successful ETF, this is probably at the top end of successful ETF. Um, very few ETFs in history have seen these kind of inflows. Um, I believe that the uh, both BlackRock and Fidelity have actually pipped the record for the top 30-day flows uh, out of any ETF. So uh, really quite extraordinary results. Um, but it just shows you that this is, this is quite sizable. Now, the other thing to note is that GBTC outflows are starting to decline, right? We're having some, I mean, it started down here where we had, you know, $600 million in single day outflows, right? 550, 500. These are very big numbers. We're starting to get down to 25 million, down to 150 million, down to 90 million. These numbers are starting to get much smaller in terms of the GBTC outflows. And we are actually starting to see, and again, we had a couple of quieter days on the net inflows, but it seems to be picking up as we move into this week. So really quite exciting and, and, and fascinating stuff. Now, this, this chart here, this is again, one of our new metrics we've rolled out for the, uh, for the ETF products. Um, this is really showing you the total balance that's held. And this is where you can see the relative scale of GBTC. So in total, all of the US ETFs hold about 400, sorry, 742,000 Bitcoin, of which 442 are held by GBTC here in the purple. Um, and then we have BlackRock in blue, Fidelity in green, and you can see the Pareto distribution, which is uh, very common across you know, all financial markets and many distributions and things like that. So overall, that's the, the summary of the ETFs, um, truly extraordinary flows. Um, it is, you know, when we look at price getting up to 57,000, there is no question that this is going to be a large part of it, right? It is an enormous bid side. Um, and thus far, it has been an almost entirely net inflows with very few days of uh, net outflows, um, mostly back in the early days when GBTC was seeing the maximum uh, amount of redemption. Now, just before we move on to the realized cap and the multiplier effect, Something I just want to flag because this is this is one of my favorite charts at the moment. I think it's a really great way to visualize what's going on. The ETFs are not the only component. They're obviously a very big component, but they're not the only component going on in these markets. Now, as an analyst, this this is really some of the most exciting stuff about the Bitcoin space is that we are seeing that the market structure is evolving. 
We have derivatives, we have spot markets, we have spot exchanges being the deposit and the, and the withdrawal, the on-chain side that we're looking at right here. We now have ETFs. There's all of these different components that make this market increasingly dynamic and increasingly interesting. And it is important to keep all of these facets in mind. So let's just, if we summarize the ETFs, we're talking about net flows of something on the order of 150 million to 250 to 500 million, right? That's the kind of general scale that we're talking about in daily inflows. What we're looking at here is in positive values, um, inflows to exchanges. So these are Bitcoin in orange, Ethereum in blue, USD denominated, being deposited to any of the spot exchanges that Glassnode tracks. We also have the outflows in, again, orange and blue for Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's a whole bunch of things we can pull from this chart. We actually touched on it in last week's video, but the, the highlight here is if we look at the scale of this, we're talking about inflows and outflows. Generally speaking, they're roughly of the same order of magnitude. Um, the net flow is actually very small relative to the total. We're talking about $2.9 billion of inflows and outflows every single day that's going on at the moment for Bitcoin alone. If we look at Ethereum, we can see that it's talking about 430, 425, four, sorry, 730, 780 million per day. Now, you can also see that Bitcoin is quite clearly moving first. So this is very common, right? We saw it in 2021, Bitcoin moves first, Ethereum tends to move second. This is just a great way to visualize the kind of capital waterfall. You can actually see it back here in, 2020, in 2017 as well. It really took Bitcoin to actually finish its bull run before Ethereum saw any kind of major inflow. So it really does describe why Bitcoin dominance has been as strong as it has been, because this is just how the market works. This is what investors need to see that confidence. They see money flow into Bitcoin, and then over time, money starts to flow and, and trickle out into the risk curve. Uh, but it generally happens relatively quickly once Bitcoin has formed some kind of strength. Now, the reason why I wanted to just pause here before we get into the realized cap component is because every single, particularly the inflows, by the way, every single coin flowing in and out of exchanges. And remember, this is also a subset of total trends. There's all sorts of other transactions going on in the Bitcoin network as well. But let's just consider exchange deposits as probably a pretty good proxy for people selling, uh, re-collateralizing position, doing something market oriented. Very few people kind of deposit to an exchange and don't really do anything with it. Some will, but for the most part, inflows are a signal. And each of those coins carries with it some piece of information. How old was it? How much profit was it in? Was it in loss? Who was the investor? Are we talking about a long or a short-term holder? Were they a whale or a shrimp? These are the signatures that are left by that decision. And that is really what on-chain data is trying to do. So let's just summarize here. ETF net inflows, we're talking about 100 million, 200 million, up to 500 million per day. Every single day, we're seeing two and a half, three billion, two billion in inflows and outflows, both directions in spot exchanges. So the real highlight here is that every single one of those coins, whether it's the ETFs being transferred between different, you know, um, uh, an exchange wallet over to the market makers and then moving from there, or we're looking at actual investors moving coins in and out of spot exchanges, this is where on-chain data is pulling all of that signal from. We are essentially surveying what is going on in the market. And that is where the on-chain data comes from. That is why we look at things like profit and loss, because every single one of these coins is telling us a story. And what we're doing is aggregating those stories together to track sentiment, positioning, capital rotation, and everything else. All right, so that was a little bit of theory, but uh, I, I like to give a bit of theory here because I know that on-chain data can be a little bit overwhelming and daunting at times. But the idea is that we're just trying to understand why do we actually look at the signals that we do and how do we unpick it? So here's a good example. I wanna start with realized profit and realized loss because essentially these are the components that when you net them off against each other and sum them together, you get the realized cap. We'll come back to this. In a uptrend, it becomes increasingly difficult to take a realized loss, right? I mean, as I mentioned, very few people really still hold coins from higher prices. So in order to lock in a loss, it means you literally had to kind of buy the local high and then sell the local bottom. It happens. It's why we focus in um, uptrends, short-term holder, realized loss is going to be very useful because you really care about people who are 
traders moving around within the trend, the hot ball of money that's following price. So short-term holder realized loss for those who are more active in the market is going to be really, really powerful for that kind of thing. For the most part, overall realized loss, there's just not that much of it during an uptrend. What we do see is a uptrend in realized profit because people naturally during an uptrend, there's two things. Realized profits are a sign of a healthy market. You need to see realized profit because the market's going higher. At some point, someone's going to take chips off the table. And what realized profit is really telling you, well, technically both of them are, but you need someone else to come in with more capital than the original purchase price to buy that coin. Someone bought at 15000 they're locking in profits at 58000 Somebody has to come in with the delta between 15 and 58 times the coin value. So one way to think about realized profit, and technically if you sum these two together, realized profit and realized loss, is you're looking at how much capital is coming into Bitcoin. And what the realized cap is, is essentially the cumulative sum of all those realized profits minus the realized losses, because some guy bought at 58 and he's now selling at 40. It's a capital destruction. But if you sum up all of those different components, you end up with the overall capital invested in Bitcoin. Now, the takeaway here is that uptrends in the realized cap is therefore telling us capital inflows are taking place. You have more and more coins being revalued from lower prices to higher prices. Now, the green and the red chart I've got here is just the 30-day change of the realized cap. So think about this, like how much capital flowed in or out of Bitcoin over a 30-day period. During this stagnation period we had in early 2022, we're kind of chopping around, right? There's, there's a bit of outflow, there's a bit of inflow, but overall, relatively speaking, not a great deal happening. During the deepest part of 2022, we were talking about capital outflows of $25 billion a month, right? This is, this is kind of the deepest, darkest phase. Capital is flushing out. Stablecoin supplies are decreasing. You'll see this across Bitcoin. You'll see this across Ethereum. The realized cap is telling you that capital is leaving the industry, which also means people who bought high are still selling lower. And, you know, this bear market and this bear market floor then took an additional year to really resolve, right? This or maybe half a year. This was in June, July, um, and it was only until uh, December and January that we started to actually recover. Now, you can also see a pivot point here in October or September, you could argue, last year. Note that the realized cap was increasing, but it really started to rip higher in September, October. There was a phase shift. This is obviously when a lot of the ETF, uh, the ETF approvals started getting increasingly high odds of actually getting the thumbs up. Institutional money started to flow in, confidence started to return. And you can see it, right? We got up to something in the order of 15, 16 billion dollars per month has been flowing into Bitcoin. I mean, really for the for the entirety of 2024. So we're talking about pretty sizable capital. It's not quite at the same scale that we had back here in 2021 in the bull, right? Here we're talking about 44, 45, I mean, $60 billion per month. Seriously big numbers. Here, we're not quite at that level, right? We're still talking about, what is that, about a quarter of what we were seeing at the, uh, the bull market peak. But it is a sustained uptrend in capital inflow. And you can see it in the gradient, which is essentially what this chart is showing you, the 30-day gradient of the realized cap. So... The big picture summary here, for analysts who are looking for capital inflows, if you want to measure for how much money is flowing into Bitcoin, if anyone asks me that question, I will literally look at this chart and say, well, how much capital has actually flown into the realized cap? Now, it's not going to be a perfect model because there's going to be investors who buy and they, never, they leave it on the exchange. That's it. But now that we have these spot ETFs, coins must transact. They must go from the exchange wallet to the market maker and from the market maker across into the ETF themselves. So there is still a movement of coins. Those coins must be revalued to new prices. So if you see outflows, they will be revalued to whatever the new price is. So we're still going to be capturing these net flows, right? This is a part of the value of, uh, of these spot ETFs. Um, yes, there's trading going on in derivatives. Yes, there's trading going on in spot exchanges. My big picture takeaway from all of this is that if a coin is kind of one click away from a buyer or sell, it's a little bit different to a coin that's been withdrawn to a wallet. And therefore, there's a very specific decision, whether by an investor or by an ETF, whatever it is, to transfer that coin back into some other kind of exchange type, uh, type system. So in that instance, 
we're getting a pretty good, right? We're not talking about we're 100% off with the realized cap. We're talking about 5 10%, which for the most part, if in terms of directionality, we're going to get pretty close to when we're seeing capital inflows and outflows, right? So it's a, a nice framework to think about things from that point on. Okay, so moving into the final section, now that we've established what the realized cap is, we've established that the ETFs are probably a pretty meaningful force, but so are the spot exchanges, and the realized cap is essentially capturing all of this information in a really nice and elegant way. The question is, what is the multiplier effect? How much money needs to flow, and I'm going to make this case, how much money needs to flow into the realized cap relative to how much the market cap has changed? So we're basically saying how much money has gone in in terms of like actual liquidity adjusted capital flow relative to what the price has done. Because price, can it's volatile, it moves around all over the place. It's going to be influenced by all that trading activity. But the realized cap is a much stronger, slower anchor for real capital coming in. So what I've done here is I've essentially indexed, well, not quite indexed, but I've, I've taken the zero bound for both the market cap in black and the realized cap. So essentially they start at $0 and we're looking at how much both of those two metrics have changed since January 1st, 2023. We could obviously pick any particular level, but I started with a, enough of a distance away because obviously when you're dealing with small numbers, and this will make more sense in a second, when you're dealing with small numbers, um, when you take a ratio between them, things get a bit funky and weird. So I wanted to have enough history that we can basically see over the last year and a bit the market cap, by the way, has increased by $800 billion. I actually had to go and check this when I was building this chart because it seemed wrong. Bitcoin's market cap was $330 billion or something back in uh, on the 1st of January at the FTX lows. $330 billion. We are now over, one, what is that, $1.2 trillion or $1.1 trillion. So Bitcoin's market cap has increased by $800 billion. And I'm saying this with a smile on my face. What an incredible number to see. Now, the realized cap, has increased by about $86 billion. So you're probably starting to get a bit of a feel for, we're talking about a multiplier effect, or I'm not gonna do some quick math, but we've got 800 billion in the market cap, 86 billion in the realized cap, it's something on the order of about 10 to one, you know, 9.6, 9.8, whatever that math works out to be. That is essentially where I wanted to get to. How much money has to flow into this anchor, which is the realized cap? Liquidity adjusted, coins actually revaluing from one cost basis to another versus how much the price has changed. So by that instance, you know, over the course of the last year and a bit, the multiplier is something on the order of about 9.6 or something in that kind of order of magnitude. Now I actually did calculate this. So what I've done is taken the difference between these two curves. I've put these into a log chart just so you can actually see there's some very interesting spikes higher, right? When we get, this is the multiplier here in blue, but you can actually see the realized cap sold off quite significantly. So Yes, the price came down, but actually the realized cap came down even more because people panicked and sold at a loss. This is back in, you know, the bear market, this is the first rally. FTX was just over here left of the screen. So this first sell-off, people go, oh man, bear is back in town. We are talking about PTSD from bear market. So people actually go, oh, that's it. I'm, I'm not sticking around for 10K, I'm out. And they sold their coins at a huge loss. So the realized cap actually took some pretty brutal hits in that early period. But you can see that once confidence came back, May, June, July, August, September, September and August, we actually got quite a significant dip in the realized cap, but overall price continued to move higher. It's going to zoom in just a little bit, get rid of those early history, um, as I mentioned before. So you can see the realized cap was really struggling, right? It was, it was plateauing and trading a bit lower. We'd only had $15 billion come into the realized cap um, in around, what is this, October, 2023. Whereas the market cap had increased by about $200 billion, giving us a multiplier effect of about 11.8. And we can see in October, capital really started to flow into the realized cap and so too the market cap. So we've seen multiplier effects on the order of 6.3, 8.1. You know, it depends where you want to measure it, right? These things, it's not supposed to be perfectly precise, but we're getting a multiplier effect of dollars in versus change in market cap something on the order of, you know, 10 to 1, 8 to 1, 6 to 1, something in that ballpark. Um, there's been some numbers I've seen float around in the 100x times. Um, I'm not sure I can quite get behind those numbers. I think that's, uh, it, I mean, based on this analysis, it just doesn't quite match up. We're off by about an order of magnitude there. Um, but this is essentially my go-to strategy, looking at realized cap relative to market cap. I think that's the best way to measure this stuff. 
Now, the last thing I want to close on, uh, we actually did, I mentioned before, a research paper on the Realize Cap, um, which I'd strongly recommend people check out. You'll find a description in the link below. Um, there is a video that goes alongside it. And as part of that process, we developed this metric. Now, this here is not supposed to be perfectly precise. This is a long, slow 90 day. It's more to illustrate much of the point that I just described. What I'm doing here is looking at how much the Realize Cap changed. I don't care about direction, up or down. I take absolute values of everything. Over a 90 day window, how much did the realize cap change and how much did the market cap change? So it's kind of looking at how much did, you know, I don't care, again, I don't care about direction. It's all absolute value. I'm just looking at how much does one affect the other. So it's not going to be perfectly precise, but, you know, it, it, it's indicative. The gray chart down the bottom here, the way to think about this, how many dollars need to go into the realize cap to generate a $1 change in the market cap in either direction? Now, what you'll see is that during bear markets, 2018, 2022, you know, most of 2023, to be honest, and to be honest, even where we are right now, relatively small, right? We're talking about 20 cents. So that's a multiplier of five to one. Sometimes it gets down to 10 cents, two cents. These are very small numbers. Um, on, on the mean, which is this four-year mean you've got here in red, we got down to a level of about 23 cents. So, you know, we're talking about a multiplier somewhere between four and five. Um, again, this is a very slow metric, but uh, it's just kind of, again, illustrating the point. If we look at the bull market peaks, however, and we've actually highlighted in orange anytime it gets to 75 cents, that means you need 75 cents in to get a $1 change in the market cap. In fact, during the real late stage bull markets, right, this metric got up to 1.75. So you need $1.75 to get a $1 change in the market cap. Mm, sounds sounds like a you're putting in a lot of work to get not much result, right? Sounds like diminishing returns. So we can see that this goes from 80 cents to a dollar, to a dollar 20, to a dollar 75. It's showing you when things are just a little bit unsustainable. The realized cap requires so much capital to flow in. And by the way, what does that actually tell you? That's telling you about sell side pressure. People are taking profit. They're revaluing coins from low to high cost bases. You would, you would pair this kind of metric with long-term holder supply decreasing, with coin days destroyed going up, with realized profits increasing. These are all indicators of sell-side pressure, not only just normal sell-side pressure, but by people who've been around for a long time. And they've generally seen this before. So it's a, a little bit about trying to gauge where that smart money is and understanding what all the different parties in the, in the Bitcoin network are doing. It's all about that psychology. It's all about capital flows. And what we're trying to do here is just visualize what is going on from those different lenses. So anyway, this is just another kind of angle of attack. Um, you know, again, this is in a different format, but you know, we're talking about at the moment, this is 20 cents. So that's a ratio of five to one. It's not too dissimilar to what we've seen in 2023. So, you know, we're getting a bit of an agreement. Of course, they're coming from different angles, but slightly different transformations, but uh, hopefully a useful framework to think about things moving forward. So thanks everyone for tuning in for that session. Hopefully you found that one useful. It was a little bit kind of different, um, just exploring something which is really, really important and meaningful. Um, certainly for anyone who wants to explore on-chain data, I, I cannot recommend highly enough becoming very familiar with the Realize Cap because it is essentially the hook. It is the part of, of on-chain data, it is the backbone of so much of the powerful stuff. And it all comes from that very simple concept of price stamping. What is every coin valued at? at the time when it last moved. When someone withdrew a coin at $10,000 and they haven't touched it since, they invested $10,000 times the coin value. That gets saved until they decide to spend it again. And even with all of the error bars and you know we've got entity adjusted variants as well to clean up all the internal wallet management and self spends and all that stuff. But for the most part, the realized cap is telling you what is going on with capital flows. And it works for Bitcoin, it works for Ethereum, um, you know, we explored it even further in our coin time economics um, uh, framework with, with ARK Invest. So all of these different concepts, they revolve around this backbone of the Realize Cap. It's a really, really powerful metric. Um, it, is, it is remarkably simple and remarkably elegant, but so many things come off the back of it. And this is just one example of how we can actually look at all the ETF flows and all the dynamics and simplify it down to a single metric. Is the Realize Cap trending or not? And by what magnitude? And how does that compare to what's going on elsewhere? So anyway, hopefully that's useful. Let me know if you have any questions at all and I will catch you in the next one. Cheers.